أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المستحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقيت الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الحدى والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم Lessons from the story and the life of Nabi Musa alayhi salam has been an ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number five. Alhamdulillah, thus far we have been doing our level best to understand this prophet of Musa alayhi salam as he is the single most mentioned prophet in the entire Quran across 900 verses, 30 different surahs. Bits and pieces of his story are everywhere. His story sometimes is repeated in various chapters of the Qur'an. And <clears throat> as I was telling a few of you in my, in my private conversations, this is the first time that I have attempted to do something like this in terms of a story of a prophet from bits and pieces of the Qur'an. And um, I, I really hope I'm able to come across and get across what I want to. I know it's still early, but inshallah you'll understand as the story goes um, why I chose this story, if you haven't already. So... Previously, on the lessons from Nabi Musa, <laughs> if I can do it like that, we ended off our discussion last night by the um, reuniting of Nabi Musa and his mother. If you remember the fact that he has now reached the palace of Firaun in the arms of Asiya, and <clears throat> the, reuniting ha- the reuniting happens, excuse me, <clears throat> the reuniting happens when um, Nabi Musa is in need of uh, some milk as a newborn child, and the only one that's able to nurse him was his own uh, biological mother. Now, in terms of uh, how things happen now, there is a little bit of a different opinion in terms of the mother of Musa and her frequent visits to, uh, to, to, to the palace of Fir'aun. Uh, very few sources say that she actually lived in the palace. The majority do, that I've seen at least, talk about the fact that she would frequent the palace uh, a lot of times. Naturally, a newborn child needs milk almost every two to three hours. So she would be the only one who would nurse him. So naturally, her and Asiya became very, very close, the book said. And close to the point where you know they began talking about spirituality and the oneness of God, and Asiya was finally able to learn from her as she was she came from a very pious tribe, uh, the mother of Musa did, and a very very pious uh, background, and so they became quite close. They say. The story now of Rabbi Musa picks up a little bit into his teenage years. Okay, when now, you know, past the years of him being Baligh, so we're assuming around 16, 17 years old, uh, from the, the, the moment that he's born into the palace of Fir'aun, and up until now, very few things are said about him, but one would assume that he lived a very comfortable life in the palace, and that Fir'aun began to take him not only as his son, but as his heir apparent, as the one who will take over this entire kingdom. Okay, now as he gets a little bit older, Nabi Musa, he's starting now to see uh, firsthand the amount of zulm that Fir'aun does onto the Bani Israel and the Israelites. And the books tell us that every so often, whenever he can, he would sneak out of the palace of Fir'aun and he would go to the, uh, to the neighborhood of the Bani Israel tribe and he would give them some aid, some relief, 
give them some hope. Even in Bahar al-Anwar, there's a hadith that, uh, and I can give you the source, those who wish to have it, you can, uh, you, you can PM me afterwards. There is a source that says that uh, he would teach uh, the, um, the Israelites that there will be a prophet at the end named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, that will be, uh, you know, the savior, and that will establish a true deen, a true sharia, a complete book, etc., etc. And he says one of the best ways for you to relieve yourself from the dhulm of of, of Fir'aun is to recite salawat on Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. That's actually quoted in Bahar. Okay, um, so that I found to be interesting. And so he would, you know, he had, uh, he had privileged information on how Fir'aun wished to make life for the Israelites very difficult and how, of course, he elevated the Egyptians altogether. Around the age of 18 to 19 years old, uh, that's when the Qur'an, and again, as we do every single night, at the end of the story, we'll go through the various um, corresponding verses in the Qur'an. And today, just so you have a little bit of a head, again, we're going to still be in Surah Qasas, Surah number 28, and um, 14 all the way down to verse number 19. We'll look at six verses today, 14, 15, all the way down to 19. If you can have that Quran ready, again, if I can ask you all to sit as a family, call them if they're, if they're on their TV, if they're on their iPad, if they're, on, if they're playing their Call of Duty, call them, bring them downstairs, sit them down in front of the device, you know, get used to this nice face, and let, let's, let's learn together in only about half an hour. I literally I will not go past half an hour. I don't usually. I won't tonight. But this story is getting better and better. And it's, instead of binge watching something on Netflix, let's binge read the Quran. You like how I did that? Yeah, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was good. That was good, Sayyid said. Thanks, man. You're welcome. Okay. So now um, he's in his teenage years. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when he reaches that stage, we begin to give him some hikmah. We give him some ilm, we give him some wisdom. Okay? Now, you know, these, these signs of a savior that the Bani Israel tribe was talking about, he begins now to slowly but surely kind of form that. In fact, some reports say that the Israelites would, would, would gather with the senior senior scholars of the Bani Israel tribe and talk about the Savior. Much like you and I talk about Imam Zamana today, they were talking about this Savior, right? Not knowing that Nabi Musa was, of course, their ultimate Savior, right? But people began to realize that he was a little bit different from Fir'aun altogether. And then the story, the famous story of when he was roughly in his 30s now, so we're jumping all the way now to when he was late 20s, early 30s, and he decides now to make his trip out of the palace into basically the capital of Egypt. Okay? And, 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 and judging based on the wording in the verses, it tells us that the palace of Fir'aun was, uh, was, was outside the outskirts of the main city, and he was traveling inside of the, um, inside of the city itself. Okay? And again, judging based on the Arabic, and we'll go through it at the end, 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 of, end, of, end of the speech, that he enters the bazaar or the main area or the main marketplace at night, right? It says, Hina ghafla, at the time of ghafla. It's interesting to note that the Quran refers to the night as the, as, as the time of ghafla, of heedlessness. Okay, that's a whole different discussion altogether, and I'm really stopping myself from going down that right, but I'm going to lose sight of the, of the, of the story, Okay. So now, this enters now the second stage, is a phase in his life. The first phase that we discussed over four lectures, three lectures, was his birth, and then his reuniting with his mother, him being now in the, in, in, in the palace of Fir'aun. Now comes the second stage in his life, which is his teenage years, his 20s now, and now he is late 20s, early 30s, and this incident now happens where he is inside the, the, the marketplace or the, or the main city, and he witnesses a fight. Okay? A fight between two people, between an Egyptian and an Israelite. Okay? And the Israelite sees Nabi Musa, and everybody knew that he, his background was from the Bani Israel tribe, and back then everything was tribalism, and so he would call. He would call Musa to come and help me, come and help me, come and help me. So Musa tries, of course, to break them up, break them up, break them up. The Egyptian is very aggressive, the reports say, to the point where without force... Without force, Nabi Musa really can't break it, break them apart. He became so aggressive, the Egyptian, 
onto Nabi Musa and his fellow Israelite that Musa then physically punches him. And when he punches him in the chest, the reports say, the e Egyptian stumbled back, tripped on something, hid his head on a rock, and passed away. Okay? Died. Okay? Now, Musa is dejected. He's upset. He can't believe it. For several reasons. Number one, I mean, he, you know, this man is dead. Albeit a, an enemy of his own tribe, it doesn't matter. Right? Secondly, he's thinking to himself, now can you imagine a thousand thoughts are now running through his head? Secondly, he thinks to himself that if Fir'aun finds out that I did this to a fellow, to, to, to an Egyptian, he's going to for sure, for sure now, um, come up with the idea that me being an Israelite, I have something against the Egyptians, and so that's going to cause a problem. Okay, assuming of course that when a fight happens like this, there's always a crowd. Even now, when you see a fight break out in a mall somewhere, there's bound to be a crowd, right? It's not like it was those two alone in Nabi Musa, so people had saw had seen this, right? So right away, the first thing that Nabi Musa does is he leaves, he flees, he just takes off. Okay, he takes off, leaves the body there. The the the, the Israeli that, that, that he's asking for help, he stays there and he takes off. And he goes running through the streets, doesn't know what to do, has no idea. He can't go back to the palace. He can't go back to the, to, to the scene of the fight. He, he can't go back to his mom's house. He can't do anything. And so he's just in, in this disarray, this complete, absolute chaotic state. Doesn't know an array of emotions now. Guilt and remorse over what happened to the Egyptian. Fear over what's, gonna, what, what's Fir'aun's uh, reaction. Right? Where do I go from here? I can't expose my, bio, my, my biological mother because that might cause problems. All these things are there. And so they say that he found a very, very quiet, remote place of seclusion, isolation. And he just sat there. Thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And he sat there and then of course he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one thing is that when that incident happened, everybody was in shock. Musa turns to the Israelite and says, this is a work of shaitan. This is a work of shaitan. Okay? And now we'll explain what that means when we, when, we, when, we, when we visit the verses. But it's a work of shaitan and then he leaves. And he finds a quiet place from to really do some introspection. What did I do? How did I do it? How do I fix this now? The first thing he does is he turns to God. Regretful, remorseful, begging for forgiveness. I was just trying to uphold some justice, right? He's telling himself, I was just trying to defend those people that were constantly the source of dhulm and oppression. I never meant to, 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 to do what happened to that, that Egyptian, right? Turns to Allah, just absolutely um, remorseful, regretful, Filled, filled with, 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 with heaviness in his heart. And either an inspiration comes inside of him, because right now at this point he's not yet a prophet. Okay? He's right now in his 30s. Some say 30, 29, 31, right? In, his, you know, in, that, in, in, in that era of, of his life. But he does get inspiration that he's been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And a sense of relief comes over him. Now, one point I want to make here, I always make it here, and I know a lot of my youth, my young guys are listening to me right now, and I really want them to focus on what I'm saying. I need to always say this, and I say it all the time at Beit al in New Jersey. I've said it in, 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 in my one camp at Beit al-Asr, that we have to start believing in the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This entire season of worship, from the first Sarajab Rajab until today, in the month of Ramadan, has been, has been a constant, constant flow of forgiveness. When somebody asked our sixth Imam, what is the best act in the month of Sha'aban? He says, istighfar. And actually, actually now leaves for us as a treasure, a very specific khas dhikr to recite in the month of Sha'aban, astaghfirullah wa as'aluhu tawbah. Munadat al-Sha'abani is filled with this regretful, remorseful individual calling out to his Lord. You have to believe, my youth, my young ones out there who are making mistakes and, 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 and sinning, no doubt. And I'm not condoning that. I'm not saying go out and, and, and go crazy. It's okay. But I am saying that do not dare. Do me a favor and promise me, Asad Bahai, that you will not fall into hopelessness. The way that 
the way that the books described and the way that Musa turned back to his Lord, it was such a beautiful moment in isolation, in seclusion. Right now, well, you and I are right now in seclusion, right? Our masjids are closed. We're home alone. I always say it wherever I go in all my various webinars and classes in the past two, three weeks, that this seclusion is something that we will never get again. And I hope it doesn't take another pandemic, but this is, these are golden opportunities, as I often say, for us to turn back inwards and clean up the mess. Spring clean our closet, spring clean our drawers, spring clean our garage and basement, and spring clean the soul as well. This is the moment when he had nobody, didn't know where to go, couldn't go to his mom's house, couldn't go to the palace of the one who was, who was giving him shelter, couldn't go back to the scene of, of the fight, and he just found himself nowhere to turn, and the first place he thinks of is turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know for some of my youth out there, 14, 15, 13, 18, 19 years old, 21 years old, this life can be very lonely for you. You, come, you, you get to a point where you think that no one gets me. I said, right? my parents don't get me. My friends don't get me. Sometimes I'm confused about myself. Where do I turn? What do I do? At that moment, you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's always there. The moment that you knock on his door, the moment that you hit the reset button and turn back to him, he will always be there waiting for you. You give me one verse. You give me one hadith. You give me any saying of any alim. Anything that your parents ever said to you that will ever make you believe that no matter how much I turn back to God, he will, he will reject me, turn his back away from me. He'll ignore me. Absolutely not. When you're ready to call me, he says, I will answer your call. Whenever you call him, he will answer your call. He will answer your call. And these are the nice, beautiful nights. Beautiful nights of Ramadan. Turn back to him. Don't ever, ever, ever convince yourself that your sin, your mistakes, all, right, all of those habits you have are, are, are greater and more powerful than the mercy of your Lord. Nothing is more powerful than the mercy of your Lord. No act that you do, no act that I do. doesn't matter if your closet is filled with skeletons. Those skeletons can be easily removed if you sincerely turn back to Allah just like Musa did after such a monumental act. Now, the books say that he spent the night there at that spot, okay? And wakes up in the morning and he makes his way back towards the same way that he came, okay? He went back to the scene of the fight. He finds out that the body is gone, picked up by the Egyptian officials, found out that this was an Egyptian, of course, that was killed at the hands of an Israelite. Now, do people know what happened? There must have been witnesses. We'll find out a little bit later on how and what happened exactly. But as he enters that, the very next day now, Musa enters that same scene of the fight, he then hears a familiar call asking for help. It's the same guy from yesterday, the same Israelite from yesterday who was fighting this guy that Musa went and, and accidentally killed. Now he's in another fight, a second fight, calling Musa for help again. Musa looks at him and says, are you serious? Like, I'm paraphrasing, but you again? Like, like, like just yesterday you were involved in the same spot in a different fight with a different Egyptian. Now you're calling me for help? Now, it's almost as if Musa's, Musa's uh, uh, words that this is the act of shaitan now almost makes complete sense now. Maybe at that moment now, he realizes that I was haste in me helping this individual. I helped him because he was my own. He was from my tribe. And he, he is right now a target uh, and a victim of the oppression of Firaun. But there's something wrong with this guy. He keeps fighting and fighting and fighting. And so, you know, he comes, and again, Musa now, of course, you know, because, because now he feels this, this responsibility, he goes, and again, he begins to now separate them. And when things get to a boiling point, the Egyptian, the new Egyptian, now turns to Musa and says to him, what, are you going to kill me now the way you killed that guy from yesterday? Musa shocked. That means that word got out. Okay. And maybe, you know, the books say that either he knew this Egyptian or maybe, you know, sometimes we say things to see the reaction of the person. 
right? Maybe people had some doubts about the fact that whether or not this was something that Nabi Musa uh, did or didn't do. So let's, let's, let's send out a little bit of a feel and see what, 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 what the reaction is, right? Like, you know, where were you last night? Was that you who did this? No, what, um, what, what? And right away you could tell by the person's reaction that maybe it was him. That's one possibility. The other possibility, right, that Agha Jazari says in his Qasai Anbiya, he says that the crowd from the night before, of course, they, they recognized Nabi Musa. Who didn't? Everyone knew. He was the crown prince, right, of Egypt. And the one thing that I, I forgot to mention here was on his way back, after that night of forgiveness and night, night of, of, of kind of contemplation. They say he was hiding his face as he was going back to that point of the fight, meaning that he knew the people saw him. Okay? Now the moment that that happens, okay, now he knows. Okay? Now he knows. And then he flees. Musa flees. Nothing happens. Doesn't strike the Egyptian. Doesn't help the Israeli. Now he flees once again. Now for sure he thinks, oh my God. Now the Egyptian now realizes that everything that I heard and I knew have now been confirmed by Musa's reaction. The fact that Musa looked shocked, the fact that Musa looked like, 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 like he couldn't believe what he heard, he took off. Musa, Musa fled. And this Egyptian now goes straight to where? Straight to Pharaoh. Straight to Pharaoh. He says, look, I know who killed the Egyptian. Because up until yesterday, there was ruckus all over Egypt that who killed this Egyptian? Who killed it? His body was left. There's no traces. The, the, the scene was fled by, 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 the, by the proper people. Who was it? Who was it? So there was clues everywhere, blah, blah, blah. This man comes and says it was actually Musa, the Pharaoh, who killed this Egyptian. Okay? Now, keep in mind, there's always been a little bit of a hint of animosity and a little bit of a, of a, of a you know, friction between Fir'aun and Musa. Even as Musa was growing up, and nowhere you know, do we suggest that, that he was disrespectful. He was very careful, Musa, to Fir'aun in terms of his teenage years and then growing up. Very, very careful. In fact, his remorse about how will I go back and explain this to Fir'aun was not because he loved the man, but nonetheless... There was a cordial, respectful relationship with Musa and Fir'aun. Okay? But there was always this element, this boiling point underneath them. Because, you know, Fir'aun knew this was an Israelite. Doesn't trust an Israelite. Okay? Something, so, something isn't right with him. Okay? And so, you know, when he heard this, of course, he thought to himself, you know what? You need to prove what you're saying. So witnesses were brought in. It's a whole case now pre presented in front of Fir'aun, right? There was eyewitnesses. And so, and so there were people that were around that saw the fight. Everything was there. Fir'aun had no choice but to what? But to, but, but to declare that, that Musa was guilty of killing the Egyptian. He then sends out a warrant for his arrest. That anyone who captures Musa, bring him to the palace, he will be killed on the spot. He will be killed on the spot. Where is Musa at this moment? He's fled. No idea where, where he is. Nobody has any idea where he is at this moment. All we now know is that there is a warrant for his arrest and that when captured, he will be killed on the spot. And I'm going to leave you with that until tomorrow. Let's come to the verses in the Quran now, inshallah. Okay? I'm telling you, the, the suspense is killing us now. What's going to happen? Will they get caught? Will he be killed? How's it going to happen? Dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know you guys can't wait until tomorrow. Let's open our Qurans now, inshallah. Let's go. Surah Qasas, uh, 28th chapter, verse number 14 is the first one. Again, these are all related to the story I just told you, inshallah. And then we'll wrap up. I'm already 25 minutes into my lecture. I don't want to come into my Asqari's time, inshallah. Um, so, um, um, Surah number 28, Surah Qasas, verse number 14. This is where Allah says that we have given him, at the time of Balugh, or a little bit older, the books say 18 years old, uh, hikmah and ilm, that is specific to the prophets. Meaning, not, the, not, not prophethood per se, but a little bit of access to worlds that the norm d d does not have. Again, the, the, Quran, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ 
wastawa. So when he became balig, balaga, balig, a little bit older now, he became mature, right? And he was fully grown, they say. So he's a full man now. He's fully grown now, right? Atainahu hukman wa We gave him. Allah says we. Atainahu. We gave him what? We gave him wisdom and we gave him knowledge as well. Okay? So that's the first point that I made. That's from 2014. Now let's come to 2815. This is where now this fighting occurs, okay? And look at the way that the, 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 the Quran describes it, right? Again, he enters Medina, the city. City meaning the, the, the capital where all the, all the action happens, right? At the time of ghaflat, in the time of the day that's known as ghaflat, which is heedless, which is the night. The night is the time of heedless. My youth out there, remember, the moment the night hits, be really weary of shaitan. Okay? What we do at night is nowhere near what we do at the daytime. Our thoughts at night are different than our thoughts at, are, 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 at day. Think about what you think about and what, are, what you have access to at midnight as opposed to what you have access to, access to at 12 noon. Okay? The Quran very beautifully, beautifully refers to the nighttime as Hina Rafla. Okay? And he enters this area that were the, 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 the basically where the Israelites. Uh, were more or less found. Remember, I, I said a few nights ago, Fir'aun would break them up into tribes, right? And place them accordingly. They wouldn't allow them to mix, okay? There he finds, فَوَجَدَ uh, فِيهَا two, رَجُلَيْنِ uh, Two individuals, two men, that were doing, that were doing what? That were fighting, right? يَقْتَتِلَانِ That were fighting, right? One of them, هَذَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ وَهَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ One was, هَذَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ هَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ One was from his Shi'as, one was from his enemies. The fact that the Qur'an uses Shi'a there, meaning a follower, the lexical dictionary meaning of a Shi'a is a follower, right? This was, these were, this was an individual who was a Shi'a of Musa, meaning Musa had a following at this moment. A following, not a prophet, but people kind of, you know, looked, for, looked to him for wisdom, for knowledge, for relief, for hope, right? And this was a person who was one of them, who was a person who was funny. And the other them was one of his enemies, meaning the, meaning the Egyptians, okay? And then there was a cry for help, right? فَاسْتَغَافَهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ Calls out, one of his shields calls out, come and help me, come and help me, against his, um, um, against this enemy. Okay, and I'll skip to the English because I don't have time anymore. It's already 27 minutes. So he, he who was of his party cried out to him for help against him who was his enemies. So Musa struck him with his fist and killed him. Okay? And then he says, قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ shaytan. This is from an act of shaitan. إِنَّهُ adu مُضِلُّ mubin. He is an open enemy, open leading astray. Okay? Just like I told you. Now, come to 16. This is when now he finds himself alone not going home, not going to the palace, devastated over what happened, doesn't know where to turn, turns back to his Lord. قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي Allah, but I've wronged myself. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. فَغْفِلْ لِي Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Um, and so what happens? Allah says, فَغَفِرْ لَهُ فَغَفَرَ لَهُ We have now protected him. إِنَّهُ هُوَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Meaning right away Allah says, we forgive you. We forgive you. Now, how Nabi Musa knew Allah forgave you is up for discussion. Forgave him is up for discussion. Okay? We understand that if there was inspiration for the mother of Musa, there's also some inspiration for Musa al Islam as well. Okay? Surely you'll find Allah what? You'll find him somebody who is forgiving and merciful. Okay? Then he says, then he says, now th this is a very beautiful line to Nabi Musa, Nabi Musa says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O my Lord, because you have bestowed a favor on me, I shall never be a backer of the guilty ones. Right? I should never be those who, you know, I, I, I can't now move away. Right? I can't defend those. I, I, I can't turn my back against you. I can't forget about you. You've given me way too much. Okay? And then verse number 18 He once again now goes back to the city, and again, that same individual who fought yesterday now is asking for his help again in a new fight now. And again, the, 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 the Quran captures this moment, moment. Verse number 18, and then I'll end, inshallah, with, with, with one more verse. And then he goes back, right? فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفًا He's fearful now, 
right? يَتَرَقَّبُ He's waiting now, right? فَإِذَا When all of a sudden الَّذِي 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 اسْتَنْثَرُهُ بِالْأَمْسِ The same individual now who's asking for assistance the day before is now calling Musa again, right? Calling out to Musa. Now Musa says, you again? قَالَ لَهُ Musa. Musa says to him what? إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيٌّ مُبِينٌ You're... Something wrong with you. There's something. Something is. Something is wrong with you. You are in manifest error, as it says. The, you know, you have to get yourself checked. Like it's one thing about yesterday, but now today again, right? The common problem is you in both days. Okay. And then at that moment now, when now Musa still helps that Israelite, gets to a point where things get heated and things are, are escalating. Now one side is, is, is the Egyptian, one side is, is, is Musa's fellow tribesmen, right? And then when things get a little bit heated, the Egyptian, the second one now, turns to Musa now. And this is where, this is where the Quran captures this moment. So when he desired, desired, desired to seize him, who was an enemy to them both, he being Musa, the enemy being the Egyptian, he said, who said? The Egyptian said, O oh Musa, do you intend to kill me? as you killed the person yesterday, right? You desire nothing but that you should be a tyrant in the land and you do not desire to be of those who act aright. He called them out. He called them out. You want to do dhulm. You, 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 you don't want to do anything that's right. That shook, shook Musa at the core. And then he fled. And that's where we'll leave you off for today, inshallah. Remember, the warrant for his arrest now, looking for him, nowhere to be found is Musa. Nobody knows where Musa is. Fir'aun now wants him. Bring him to the palace. I'm going to kill him. That's it. It's over. Let's see what happens tomorrow, inshallah. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to accept our qaleel efforts, inshallah, in understanding your words, applying your words. We ask you, Allah, to forgive our sins, accept our amal, and inshallah, make us stand beside the imam when he comes. We will see you tomorrow night, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.